Um, anyway, this is Steve, Sam, and the door. Let's give him a big DEFCON welcome. Afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for having us here. You may not believe it, but not only was that our first shot at DEF CON, it was actually our first shot ever since, since we got fr away from breakfast this morning anyway. So, all right. Well, welcome, guys. Uh, thanks for having us. We're here to talk about the conclusion of our research. Feels like it's been a long time into hacking an access control system. So this is called Perimeter Breach. My name is Steve Pavoni. I'm head of advanced threat research and principal engineer at Trellix. And my Twitter handle is here if you want to connect afterwards. I, most of the team makes fun of me since I'm a manager. Usually they you know, joke that I'm not allowed to do anything but Excel spreadsheets, which I can write a mean function in. But when I'm doing technical stuff, I'm inter interested in vulnerability root cause analysis, reverse engineering, uh, exploitation, and actually with this project, got some experience for the first time with hardware hacking. My name is Sam Quinn. I'm a senior security researcher at Trellix. Um, I could have summed all this up with just hacking. I, I really like all aspects of it, but some of my core technical interests are listed here. Um, I like exploitation, hardware hacking, um, looking at embedded systems like IoT devices and things like that, as well as just OS fundamentals. Now, Sam and I have interests outside of just hacking and computers, and we're both avid mountain bikers as well, as you'll see when we're not in the lab finding crashes, we're somewhere out there and crashes manage to find us either way. So this is real footage, by the way. Like, we're not, we're not faking anything here. All right, let's get right to it. Uh, the target for today and what we chose is the HID Mercury access control panel, which is this beautiful bright red board that you see. We chose the Linnell 4420, which is a partner of HID Mercury. And the reason we got interested in it, and we're going to talk about the how, the what, the whys of this project, but we got interested in it because obviously access control is one of those areas of critical infrastructure and industrial control systems that is really prevalent in this increasingly targeted attack space and really has not been widely researched, especially over the past few years. So we got interested in it for that reason. Before we get into the why and the how we did this project, Let's set the stage for how this is typically deployed. Well, you see this beautiful door on stage that we uh, unceremoniously brought in halfway through the last person's presentation. Uh, this is actually the Linnell uh, card reader controller is, is plugged in behind there, and we have it managed to a badge reader. This is typically going to be deployed on a local network. It is possible to make this cloud facing or internet facing, but highly non recommended. The, the panel itself can manage up to 64 different devices. In this case, we're using a badge reader. And being on a local network, we use a local network manager or an LSM to actually manage the door operations. And for Linnell, that's this server called OnGuard. That's the server that's responsible for, for facilitating all of the user control, badges, access, all of that provisioning. And then the board itself is kind of a dumb control relay. It essentially just uh, flipped electric re relays, and we'll talk about that quite a bit more. Well, one of the things that first caught our eyes when we were exploring this target, this 4400 panel, was some marketing material from Linnell that had specified that this had been approved for use in government facilities following, quote, rigorous security, vulnerability, and interoperability testing. Well, obviously, this really kind of intrigued us. We found out through the research process that this was intended to specify physical security testing, but really led us down the track of saying, how does this hold up from a cybersecurity perspective? And that's what led us to these findings. Now, we did originally disclose all of this uh, just a couple months ago at Hardware I.O., where we spent a lot more time focusing on the hardware hacking process and getting to a root shell, which we'll show you is going to be our starting point for today. And so for the purposes of this talk, we're going to focus on just three of the eight CVEs. But we submitted and ultimately got patched eight CVEs, four of which are zero-day unauthenticated uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities, or were at the time we disclosed them. These are now all fully patched. The who in this scenario is who was affected by this. And as you can see here, the 4420 panel was the one that we chose and ordered off of eBay for a few hundred bucks. But throughout the research process, we did find out that addi additional eight boards manufactured by HID were also vulnerable to these same issues. And so there was a much wider install base than we had originally thought. 
Furthermore, there's more than 20 partners of HID Mercury, including Linnell, the board that we looked at there, uh, that use these boards and rely on them, and uh, all of them were vulnerable to the same issues as well. So this represents millions of controllers at tens of thousands of sites worldwide, and really the vast majority of the Fortune 100 companies. So the install base is pretty uh, impactful. We chose to approach this project in what we call choose your pwn adventure, a little spin on the, uh, the classical phrase here. And what that means to us is we're going to explain the process we took at various iterations of the project and the decisions we made at those steps and why. Now again, I mentioned how we have already disclosed these issues at Hardware I.O. So for today, we're going to start assuming we have a root shell on the device, which we do. And we're going to actually live hack it in iterations on stage here throughout the process. So of course, what could go wrong? We're not doing just one demo, but like three live ones. So we're going to really tempt the demo gods. This is all a network uh, vulnerability. So you have to be on the same network as the device, which uh, many of you know is kind of the low bar of exploitation. But either way, these are unauthenticated RCEs. As far as standard operations for the panel, one of the first things we looked at was, of course, doing a network scan. And we used Nmap to find just these three open ports. I know with the lights, uh, it might be kind of hard to read. So just like throw your hand up if you can't see or interested in something. But we, uh, the ports that, were, were, that showed up on the scan were port 80 and 443 for the embedded web server that runs. And a separate port 3001, which at the time we didn't know what it did and found out later that was that management server, the on-guard management server, how it communicates to the panel directly. But because we bought it off eBay, we had kind of this half-baked solution and we didn't have the on-guard set up at this point. When you boot up the web server on the device, which comes on uh, automatically and by default, you're greeted with a typical login screen, admin password. You'll see this in a moment. It does pretty standard session management, including uh, cookies uh, for the most part. A uh, little uh, preview of things to come there. It does it quite well. Configuration pages are primarily what you see inside of this web server. So there are, if you look closely, there's, there's almost nothing that's related to actual badge usage or anything related to doors. This web server is used to configure the panel, and then it becomes kind of useless from that point on, where you'll take over with the on-guard server and do all of the door-specific functions. The network setup page really caught our attention. It has a number of inputs. We'll show you why it was really interesting in a moment here. For right now, you can just see that it's managing the host name of the device, and we'll come back to that. All right. So that brings us to Choose Your Pwn Adventure number one, where early in this project, we were just trying to look for an RCE, our, our first zero day, and hypothetically unauthenticated. Three different areas that we could have explored here, the first one being an operating system vulnerability. This would include things like the vendor and product specific libraries and files, keys, creds, crypto, you know, the typical stuff here, maybe configuration flaws. We chose to go with more of a combination of web-based and network vulnerability, and we decided to look at things like command injection because we had a web server that took user input and directly contacted the board and worked with the board. So uh, bypassing the network stack, which would have really been looking for probably an end day or maybe a really cool O day in third-party libraries or networking stack itself. So the process we went about as we decided to look at the, the web form, and of course we're shortening this a little bit, but one of the areas that was interesting was command injection. And our injection candidate here was the device hostname itself. If you look at one of the root processes that spun up when the board boots here, there's a DHCP call where it does all of the network factoring. And one of the uh, parameters to that DHCP call is dash H, or host name, of the controller. In this case, it's controller one. And we can see by catting out the host name file that it is coming from the controller one. So if we can control input through the web server and get it to actually execute commands as root, that's a pretty cool command injection. Now, before we talk about that some more, let's look at what are the restrictions. Everybody has client-side JavaScript restrictions. This is no different. What you'll see here, if you can't read it, is this is a alphanumeric and period and hyphen are the only characters allowed on the client side. When we look at the actual JavaScript, it matches up very well to the string. It's only allowing alphanumeric and period and hyphen. On the server side, there's a function called XSS string test for cross-site scripting string test. And that looks for some additional kind of funky characters here. Of course, tied to cross-site scripting and other injection attacks. But for us, the ones that were most harmful to work around were the forward slash, of course, if we wanted to do a path and a command injection, the ampersand, and the semicolon character for delimiting, delimiting commands. 
One final thing here was this parse forms data function. And the thing to pay attention to here is this a string tokenizer function, which will split our host name every time it sees either an equals or space. Equals we probably don't care about, but the space is a really useful character in command injection, and so we had to find a way around that. Before we get into that, let's talk about authentication and how it's handled. For Git and Post, this is kind of funny here. So Git, Git, Git requests are handled exactly as you'd imagine. A session ID is created by calling Git session ID and return, and then as you'd expect, that session ID is compared to the session ID that's taken from the cookie value. If it checks out, the page is authenticated. Now for post requests, it's done slightly differently and uh, pretty poorly here. So it calls Git session ID from cookie, so good, or so far so good, but then it never compares that to anything. So we can use any arbitrary session cookie value. You'll see Sam use 1337, 1337 in a moment here, and we can send any post data completely unauthenticated, uh, and it'll actually redirect to get requests looking like it failed, but it'll actually send the data. All right, let's tempt the demo gods, and uh, Sam, you want to take over and do a little dive demo for us? Oh yeah, thank you. All right, so here we go. Um, Let's get the correct window where it should be. It is over here. Let's see. Is that? I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna go a little bit bigger. Hopefully that's better. Um, all right. So didn't clear this from our test before, but we're gonna start a listening server. Um, this is gonna be the kind of kind of the command and control um, aspect of this. We'll kind of dive into this a little bit more in detail. However, we'll start that off and just have that run in the background. When we now go to um, the, we'll actually bring up the um, <laughs> the web server. Yeah. All right. So this is actually the uh, um, <laughs> the website that is running on the Linux system on the board itself. And of course, as you can see, there is a login page as uh, normal. And if we go ahead and log in, um, it will indeed give us that cookie that Steve mentioned earlier. All right, so logging in, and it might be hard to see, but over here, there are some session IDs getting appended to the Git requests, and if we looked into the um, post parameters, there's also a cookie there as well. But we'll go over to that network uh, host name that we wanted to command eject into. And as, I, as you can see, it is controller one at the moment, and now if we go ahead and actually try to do our unauthentic command injection, by running this command where it is, uh, we saved it off, um, CI1. So this is the command injection where it's now bypassing that JavaScript that Steve showed earlier where it's restricting characters and whatnot. Um, we do have the cookie as just a bogus 1337, uh, super elite cookie there. Um, and then the host name has this command injection that we'll cover in more detail in just a second, so uh, hold on for that. But as you can see, there's really nothing here that should have allowed this to, to take place. So if we go ahead and run this, it looks like it failed. That's because the post data actually did take effect, but then when it tries to refresh the page, the get request actually fails. So that's why we see this timeout error here. But if we go back to the web page and actually refresh this by just clicking on network again, you can see now the host name is that big long command injection that we actually sent. That was all unauthenticated. Anyone uh, could have done that without knowing the password or anything. So now we'll go back into our slides and I'll kind of explain why we chose that set of uh, command injection uh, characters and whatnot. So the, as Steve mentioned, this is not a space, but it works just, as, just the same in Linux uh, interpreters. So that is actually a tab character, and that was not bypassed uh, or checked in that XSS string test function. Um, and as Steve also mentioned, this is the function that we're trying to get into, more importantly, into the host name. And because this is when you're injecting into a process, uh, it's a halting operation, so, um, and it's kind of a hard place to halt when you don't even have internet yet, so we wanted to actually reach out to that command and control server to download more commands, not uh, having to go through um, the host name with all those restrictions for forward slashes and things like that. So the way that we wanted to get this command to actually run, where it's actually W getting more commands from that listener that we set up, is to actually nest another DHCP call in here to actually have the network finish its upbringing and actually get a valid IP address so the uh, desired command injection can take place. And that worked actually 
pretty well. And that's why we filed it as our first CVE, um, unauthenticated command injection. Um, the only reason this is only rated as a CVSS 9.0 is because we can't trigger it on the, uh, like on command. It had to actually be on a reboot call where that DHCP um, process gets uh, or pulls in our host name that we uh, modified. And that's kind of where our second choose your opponent venture took place, where we needed to find some sort of reboot primitive. Um, and there's a few ways that we went about looking at this. The first was looking at the web server as we just found that command injection. Is there any uh, valid ways to cause a reboot? And the apply settings tab did indeed at the end reboot the device. However, it did check for cookies for correctly, so we couldn't use that for um, this uh, unauthenticated uh, command injection here. The next thing we could have looked at is looking for a system exhaustion where we're trying to trigger some of the watchdogs on the device to actually forcefully reboot the device uh, or the, the controller. Um, and that did work. It took about an hour uh, to actually do and it was really noisy. It was thousands and thousands of requests. But it did actually trigger the watchdog, so that was always a fallback, but we didn't really like that. We wanted to be a little bit more um, meticulous about it and actually try to find something better. So what we ended up looking at was trying to find some sort of crash that would cause a seg fault and then, um, you know, look for more memory corruption vulnerabilities where we can actually use that to actually reboot the device. And the reason a seg fault here would cause a reboot is when we started to look at that as an avenue, uh, all segmentation faults on the device called a custom core dump handler. And you can always check what core dump handler is on your machine by catting out this uh, core pattern file in your proc uh, file system. And as you can see here, this one <laughs> even says custom MSC <laughs> core dump handler. So uh, that was kind of interesting and that is just a bash script that if you look at the very bottom, uh, it eventually does call reboot. And this was perfect for us since all of the websites or uh, web pages on the device our CGI bin compiled the files, uh, any of them, if you can cause a memory corruption vulnerability, will dump their core. So that's where we started to look uh, with uh, our, uh, <laughs> as, as much as possible. And to do that, we wanted to really kind of improve our odds with automation. Anytime I get to write a tool, I get pretty happy. So using Ida uh, Python here, we started to look for some of these dangerous functions that you're can most familiar um, kind of uh, or <laughs> most common ways to actually get um, memory corruption vulnerabilities. So there's a list here. I'm not going to go through them. But looking for these and with the power of automation through Ida Python, we wanted to actually find where these were user input could actually hit these before any authentication took place. So the Python script would find where these were being um, ran before any sort of uh, uh, authentication or cookie check would take place. And as you can see, we did find a few. However, all of them were actually programmed perfectly fine uh, with static size fields, things like that. Um, not very helpful for us to find memory corruption vulnerabilities. However, on the next page here, as the list continues, the last one is an advanced network CGI, which did have eight stir copies that we could actually use for um, command or uh, for memory corruption vulnerabilities where the source and destination pointers were actually con attacker controlled or user. Uh, what we passed in as the, um, the user, we could modify. The way we wanted to test this, because it's never good to test live on the only board that you bought off eBay, is we actually set up an ARM QEMU uh, uh, virtual machine to actually emulate these. And the way that we emulated it is, since we have that root access on the machine, we actually dumped the whole MTD partitions of all of the, um, you know, like the, the file system, the boot, all of that. Um, and then actually CH rooted into it through this, this ARM VM. And that means that all of the configuration files and uh, all of the other files that it's looking for are actually in the right spot since now we're into the CH root environment. And we can execute these binaries as usual. So you can see this is kind of a joke, but we're actually interacting with that advanced network CGI bin file that we identified statically could have these uh, memory corruption vulnerabilities in by e just echoing um, parameters into it. So this is how the CGI bin files take post parameters and uh, you can see right below there is the, um, the timeout window that we saw when we did the live demo earlier. So it is working pro properly. Now we wanted to fuzz it. So <laughs> to do that we used Redamza. It's a pretty really simple um, 
uh, fuzzer that just is a mutates whatever you pass into the standard in, and then on its standard out will have something uh, modified. So you, you see here, there is this is a test passed directly into Redamza, and then it gets mutated to yeah, something else. <laughs> they uh, change some bytes to non ASCII printables. And to do this for the CGI bin files, since they take the post parameters over uh, standard in as well, we can take a valid post parameter string just pulled right out of the, um, the web server and then pass it into Redamza. And as you can see, it flipped one of the last octets on this DNS server to negative one, which pretty good test in my opinion. So we didn't want to run this fully, you know, manual every single time. That's not how fuzzing works. So we set up this little, uh, this little fuzzer that's, uh, I think, pretty cute. It's uh, <laughs> like 13 lines of code or something. But um, it is all written in shell, and it uses the, uh, the Redams uh, um, mutator. So you pass in the normal post parameter uh, files here to get mutated. As soon as it gets mutated, we actually pass that directly into whatever CGI bin file we want to look at. And then, of course, if it crashes, which means it returned a return code other than zero, um, we rerun the whole test case with the mutated data inside of GDB and then um, call a backtrace on it. So while it looks super simple, it actually gives great, uh, great results where this is a crash that we found from that. So you can see that the account stir here has a much longer string than it usually has. Um, and that is what Redamza decided to mutate on this run. And you can see that it crashed right below in stir copy, right as we suspected from our um, static analysis, which kind of goes to show that we spent all this time getting this like emulator set up and whatnot and didn't actually find any more crashes than we did statically, but it was still a kind of a fun learning experience. And this is where we filed this as our second CVE um, for this talk here, that uh, it's an unauthenticated denial of service where it is uh, just because it can cause a, a reboot on command, that's why uh, it's a, just a denial of service. The crash and stir copy was actually just an out of bounds read, so we couldn't use it to write anything. But um, I'll let Steve cover how we used these together as a chain to kind of continue our, our, our exploitation. Okay, so now we've got two vulnerabilities which work in concert. We have a command injection which is triggered at reboot, and we have a way to trigger reboot via segfault, so we have a way to get full unauthenticated code execution. And that meant it was time to upgrade to the latest firmware and kind of bypass our, our eBay YOLO route and see if we could make this a little bit more official. So we actually called up, we live in Portland, we called up one of the actual legitimate third party installers for Linnell Systems, a company called Convergent. We, we put heavy air quotes around social engineering. We're not like doing a ton of social engineering here, but we may have done a little cloak and dagger when we described the project to them of what we wanted them to build out. This monstrosity that you see on stage here. So uh, they're like, you want us to build what, why? Okay, you're, you're paying us how much? Okay, we're good. All right, so they came to the lab and actually built out this full system and they integrated in the OnGuard as a standalone server. And uh, you can kind of see some of the pictures here. It was wired up with a controller and card reader. So this is essentially an installation that mirrors a production building install minus the fact that we have no glass in there, um, but we'll mime that. Uh, and it actually works just like you would. And, and our controller is actually on the back on a, on a panel where you can't see it above the door. That would be in a server closet typically, but we obviously don't have room for that. So otherwise, this is a production system. They also gave us some training and hands-on experience with how to provision doors and badges and users and all the fun stuff that came with the software. That was good for us to learn, but it paled in comparison to the usefulness of being able to finally download and push firmware to the device. So we could test whether our vulnerabilities survived uh, from an older version of firmware to the latest one uh, just doing this. And we also had a copy of a legitimate firmware on the file system despite being encrypted on the Linnell that we had or on the on-guard system that we had. All right, so that brought us to a success and failure point here. The, the, let's start with the failure. And the before, as you recall Sam saying, there was a seg fault on every system binary, meaning it would reboot the system. Well, afterwards, they had restricted this just to the two main Linnell system, or Mercury system binaries here, and actually that meant that we had lost the seg fault that led to our reboot, and we couldn't arbitrarily trigger our command injection anymore. And those are the two, I know you can't read it, but those are the two files that are uh, now in the new uh, crash dump handling file. 
However, our command injection did survive an update to the latest firmware version, and that was really the higher bar here. We knew we could find some way to get this thing to crash or reboot, uh, and that was really the next step of this process. Choose your pwned adventure number three. Now we needed an alternative method of getting that unauthenticated RCE back, because all we had is code execution, unauthenticated, but not on demand. So we could have looked for a new standalone vulnerability, a zero or one click kind of uh, do it all in one here. We could have looked for a new reboot primitive or a crash to replace the one uh, that we missed in this chain here or that we lost in the upgrade process. And I suppose we could have updated the, uh, we could have actually moved on and just done our malware or door exploit because at some point the board's gonna go down or gonna be rebooted for maintenance and it's gonna trigger that command injection. Obviously we're way too lazy to do that. So we, uh, we went ahead looking for a new toy to play with. Now luckily with this upgrade came some new fun functionality here, specifically the firmware upload option. And what you'll see is this diagnostics page on the web server added the ability to upload firmware and it says specifically will reboot board. It's almost like they were in our heads here. This was exactly what we were looking for. So we're going to go ahead and do another live demo here or attempt to kind of showing you uh, how we managed to, uh, to play with this a little bit. All right. Cool. So we're back at uh, the web server here. Where is it? To the left. Okay. Um, all right. Cool. Uh, it has timed out. So um, I'm going to try my best to log back in. I can't see anything down there, but am I on it? Anybody read it? Okay. Cool. I did made that really hard to see. Let me drag it over and I'll, pu I'll pull it back. Okay. Oh, wrong address. That's why. Okay. So what I'm going to show you here is that we're going to log into the web server itself. And um, we're going to basically try to show you two things. The, uh, the ability to arbitrarily reboot the board. Sam runs everything in the Dvorak keyboard, which is really fun to switch back and forth from English to Dvorak. I knew this would bite me somewhere. All right, so we're going to show you basically trying to log into the device, do a bypass of the, of the um, login, and um, actually um, show you what the session management looks like. Is there a problem with that? Yeah, it's eight. Oh. Cool. All right. Eight, eight, eight This is fun. Okay. All right. Let me pull this back on screen so you can see it here. Okay. So we're back at the login screen and I have the developer tools up so we can see session management a little bit here, just like Sam showed. I'm going to log in for the first time legitimately so we can get a valid session cookie. Then we're going to capture the get request, log out and see if it handles it properly. So if we go over to the diagnostics tab that was added here, that's the one that I mentioned was added that has the firmware upload feature. And you probably can't see this. I'm going to highlight in developer tools. There is a diagnostic CGI tab that was requested and the session ID is validly appended onto there. So I'm going to right click and copy the, essentially the get request so we can test that logged out as well. Before we do that, if you look just a little bit further down here, what you might see is there's a request to another CGI page called view firmware update CGI. And you may have sharp eyes and see that that does not have a session ID appended onto it. So let's look at that a little bit closer. We'll log out and we'll try this get request to the diagnostics page and see if it fails, which we expect it to. Well, yes, the session cookie was not valid. It handled that properly, so it was unable to actually log in. So I got to bring this back over and I'll pull it over in just a minute so you can see this. All right. So now I'm going to go directly to that CGI page that I showed you before that was loaded, which is view firmware update directly. And what you'll see is we can browse to that page completely unauthenticated without logging in whatsoever and randomly upload files to it, which we could not believe. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right. Th thanks for bearing with me through that. Uh, demo train wreck. All right. So now we can upload a file. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a file from the file system here. And this is actually going to be running in the background. It'll cause the a seg fault, which we're going to explain to you shortly here. So you, the people in the front row may actually hear it reboot. The device as we load this is going to actually uh, seg fault and reboot. And we'll talk about how and why this works in just a moment. All right. Let's click load file, installing, and sometime in the next maybe 30 seconds, we, some of us will hear a little beep there. 
All right, let's go back to slides now and continue on and explain what's happening in the background. Okay, we have a file that we've now conf uh, controlled the file input to. There's a few areas of interest. We could look at the file contents itself. You might have just heard the board reboot or the controller reboot. We could look at the file contents itself for some kind of an overflow, the file name, the characters that are input, even the things like the file size. And we started to play around with could we control one of these to get a crash. The first thing that we did on this diagnostics page is upload an empty file called foobar.txt. Doesn't matter what it is. Didn't have any contents in it. We're just trying to see what happens. As it went ahead and tried to install that, it eventually aired out, of course. It would be really awesome if it didn't, but um, it aired out and it threw this error invalid signature size. So we knew that it was looking for some kind of a file signature and more so that it was somehow parsing a size. Well, maybe that was interesting to explore a little bit further. So the next thing that we did is we pulled up that actual valid firmware file from the, from the OnGuard system, and it's an encrypted file, so for the most part it's uninteresting, until you get to the end of the file. And the last hex 158 bytes, if you have sharp eyes, are a base64 encoded blob. As you might have guessed, this specifies the file signature, and more so at the very end there are three ASCII bytes, 158, that specify the size of that file signature. So it's not doing it dynamically, parsing in byte by byte and determining a size mathematically. It's taking, in this case, what we call a user controlled value here, because we can upload this file, and it's using that to calculate the size of, or to, to compare the size of the, uh, the file signature. So the next thing we did, of course, was go in and look at the code responsible for parsing this firmware file signature size check. So the first thing that happens is there's a malloc of, st a static malloc of 190 hex bytes, and of course then the file is opened and saved off using a file open command. So far so good. Now this is going to be hard to read, so I'll just dictate it as we go. The next function here is an fseek or a file seek. It will go to the end of the file, minus three bytes, of course, to retrieve those last three ASCII bytes, which are a size field. And using fread will read those in uh, uh, as a size uh, value. Now it will uh, take a string to long or str to l and uh, change that ASCII value to a long value. And as you guessed it, shortly later in the fread function, that'll be used as a parameter here to the size. And of course, if we have a static buffer and we have a dynamic size that we control, that's prime for overflow. And of course, this is where a heap overflow does happen. Shortly later in the file close function is where we actually see the crash happen and we can start to leverage it. And we're going to show you a little bit more detail on that. All right, our steps to overflow or, or to test this. We created a fake file, uh, basically a copy of the, the firmware file, and we filled it with a unique and predictable pattern. Just think of your Metasploit pattern create. That's what we're filling it with to see if we actually control any registers in here. Now, because this is an encrypted file, it needed, needed the salted underscore, underst underscore underscore file header. So it does check that, and we added that to the beginning of the file. And then we change the file size or file signature size here to 999. Anything over, uh, what was it, 190, the static buffer size will work. They had used 158. We changed it to 999. And then finally, we set a breakpoint here in, we'll talk about, you know, we're going really in, in the context of the emulator Sam was talking about earlier. But we set a breakpoint here before we thought we controlled execution in the file close function. And if you can see what's highlighted, it's a branch instruction, an unconditional branch, an ARM to the R3 register. Well, we know we're going to hit this. And why is that important? Well, if you look to the right side at the registers, you can see R0, R1, R3, and R6 all have our pattern data. So they've been fully crushed with the overflow. And R4 has a pointer to the pattern data that we've overflowed as well. And that's going to be important here. Now, before we go into ROP, and we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the ROP we did, we actually managed to get this working really beautifully in ROP. The next few slides will show you how that works. When we tried to transfer it back to the physical hardware, we had all sorts of issues. Like, we were just, it was unbelievable. We had uh, heap, heap confusion issues and process threading and just would not transfer back to physical hardware. So you'll see what we ended up doing is we just used that file to cause a reboot and essentially trigger our command injection, but we do have full code execution using the ROP gadget and the emulator. 
One is all we needed, just a single ROP gadget. And what we have on screen here is two commands. The first one, or the top half, is just a script using Ropper to search for ROP gadgets in all the binaries and third party or imported libraries. We did use that, and then we, put, we pushed it into a regular expression to filter it down to a set of useful gadgets. Now, even if you can read these closely, you may not know why these are useful gadgets. Obviously, we're going a little bit out of order here. You'll see that in a moment. The gadget we chose here is just these five instructions, uh, the, and we'll talk about why these are important here. The approach that we took is we wanted to, so there's a, an unconditional branch to R3 as I talked about, and that's where we get the start of control. If we can get into R3 an address that points to the beginning of our gadget, which of course we can because we control that register, we can uh, potentially call a system call here. All right, so the first step was getting an address of uh, our gadget into R3 because it gets, uh, it, because R0 is moved into R3 here. So the, the first step here is we want to get R0 as an address to our system call. It's moved into R3, and then five instructions later, that unconditional branch calls it directly. So it'll be calling system. However, to get an argument for system in ARM, the argument has to be still in R0. Well, that's beautiful because the second instruction of this gadget is moving R4 into R0, and it's not mangled in between then, so not only can we use R0 to get system, but we can use R4 to get our parameter to system, or our ver reverse shell into R0, and it'll be called uh, in the unconditional branch to R3. Okay, so good things come in small packages here. Uh, when we started to, to put these into the correct offsets in our pattern file, you can see that we used a wget command. Sam talked about this in the command injection earlier. This is going to be our attempted reverse shell. You can see the locations of where we have R4 and R0. There's only 28 contiguous bytes, though, for us to get execution before R0 is messed up. Now, as we were executing this, we thought it was working perfectly and we'd be able to get our reverse shell, but for some reason, four bytes of that reverse shell string get copied and basically pasted into eight bytes later, mangling our IP address, and so that caused an epic fail here. However, in the process of running that, Sam just, because he likes to YOLO everything, just is like, let's change it from, I don't know, like whatever it was, IP address to AAAA, like that'll make some difference. And of course, it did. And it caused a similar crash, but now A4, or R4, was located way earlier in the pattern file. So instead of having 28 contiguous bytes, we had something like 400 plus contiguous bytes. So if you can see the pattern here that R4 points to, it's, it says QKAA, that's the ASCII part of the pattern. And you'll see it here in our pattern file. So the rap gods kind of smiled on us. So now R4 is way earlier, and we don't even have to bother with this uh, reverse shell that we, we essentially push commands to from our C2 server. We can actually just call system with a direct reverse shell as the argument to it. And if we go back, that's the right side of the screen. So where R4 is, we just did a straight up SOCAT reverse shell and uh, connected to that directly. And that's what we'll show you in a minute here. All right, so let's summarize here. We have a breakpoint to our, uh, at the call to ROP, which is our, our, break, our, our branch to R3. And um, R3 has to be the address of our gadget, okay? So we can see that that does match up. The address of our gadget works. I know we're moving quickly, but you can go back and check some of these later. I know it's hard to see. There's our gadget. Once we get into executing that address, we have just those five instructions. And inside of it, the last thing is another unconditional branch to R3. So our complete pattern file here looks like this. R4 has our reverse shell in the very beginning. Some 400 bytes later, we have a system address in R0 and our gadget address in R3, and that's really all it took. And we'll see here from the complete ROP that we now have system execution with our arbitrary SOCAT uh, as, the, as the parameter to it, and you're, you see that we're on the uh, breakpoint where it's about to get called, and that, of course, does work beautifully. In an emulator. Doesn't go back real well to the hardware. We might go back and figure that out at some point. Either way, all we cared about was kind of learning this process and getting the door to crash so we could pick up our command injection. That was then filed as our highest CVSS score of 10.0. It is arbitrary, unauthenticated code injection, uh, code execution, excuse me, and uh, that was also patched. So for the last part before I do our demo, Sam's going to take us through exploitation of this. We call it malware with heavy quotes. Obviously, we're not releasing malware. In fact, we're not even really writing malware, but we are trying to interact with the door directly, and Sam's going to show you how that's done. 
All right, so we'll wrap this up here and then do the final demo. So uh, this kind of brought us to the Choose Your Pwn Adventure 4 where now we got back our uh, on-command command injection uh, with that reboot and chaining the two together. And we could have gone about creating our quote-unquote malware in two different ways. The people that were actually probably hacking this in real life would probably want to do some ransomware thing, but that's... I don't know, that's not cool. <laughs> so we wanted to do the more James Bond, Ghost in the Shell type approach where we actually um, could gain like, you know, secret access into a facility, bypassing all monitoring or whatnot. And so that's ended up what we uh, went down that path. But to do either of those, we actually needed to figure out how the door locks even work. I'm gonna kinda go quickly through this section. These are through the use of relays, which are electrical uh, switches. You can see them, there's four here right now. Um, and then the, the switch is hooked up, or each of the door locks are actually hooked up to these outputs. Um, to find out how the software actually controls those relays, you can look in the binary that has all of its symbols <laughs> for relays, and you can see that there are one function for on and off for each of these. And they're even more simple when you look at it. There is a simple uh, kernel module where you can interact with iOctal, uh, give it the file descriptor for the GPIO, uh, I don't know, <laughs> and then uh, the, the GPIO uh, device, and then a parameter, and then a zero indexed array of which uh, relay you want to actually control. So to actually make this into our malware and to open the door whenever we want, we cross compiled it for ARM with just copying that ioctal call and ran it on the device. However, you can probably see that there's this while loop here and this was our brute force way to actually keep the door unlocked. Whenever we would trigger a, an unlock, it would instantly relock. So calling it every millisecond was the, the right way <laughs> to get it to stay persistent, um, which is kind of a fun hack right there. But now we'll go on to the demo and I just want to summarize kind of what we've done up here on stage live. Um, this could have all been done with our single click exploit, but we wanted to separate it a little bit and try to explain it a little bit more. Um, the first thing we did was that command injection through the host name, unauthenticated. We then uploaded a arbitrary file, a firmware update file that we can control the signature size to, which caused a seg fault initiating that reboot that we heard uh, just a little bit ago. At that point, um, at the device startup, it's getting a, an IP address and it's calling our command injection through that host name parameter. And at this point, it's actually downloading more scripts from this laptop up here to uh, run the uh, reverse shell. And then that reverse shell gets opened and now we'll show you live connecting to that reverse shell and opening the command. So here we go, let's see if we can do it. Right. Switch to Dvorak. <laughs> Let me clear this. Goons were joking that we could make this a lot easier and just save you guys 50 minutes by doing this, but I think they were being smart asses, so. <laughs> All right. So here's the reverse shell connection. We'll go ahead and connect it and you can see that we do have a shell. And if I run, who am I? We are root and then, <laughs> and to uh, finalize it, we'll run our super elite open door hack. So here we go. All right, so that was, that was everything we have today. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming. We're gonna stick around for a couple minutes for questions. Wanna thank Carrier as well, who uh, handled the disclosure process to Mercury. They're here today. Uh, thanks to that team. Thank you guys for attending. If you wanna uh, connect with us on social media or just stop by for questions, uh, feel free. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your DEF CON. <laughs>